Hebrews in chapter 7. We're going to read again this passage that we were considering um, on the last occasion. Hebrews chapter 7, reading again at the beginning of the chapter. <clears throat> Um, chapter 7, really, um, as I said the last time, it follows on, it runs on from chapter 6. So it might help us if we read uh, the last um, three verses of chapter 6, reading at verse 18. But by two immutable things at which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge, to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, we met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and met him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the son that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that receive tithe, that die receive tithes. But there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also, who received tithes, Paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek, and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom those things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for after that the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who is made, not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before, for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh to God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath. But this with an oath by that said to him. The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made the surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. 
but for he is able also to save them to the uttermost, and come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us, who is harmless, holy, harmless, and undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests, who offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. And we trust the Lord to follow with his blessing in that reading of his own holy and inerrant word before we come to the word. Eternal Lord, we draw near in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that name that is above every name. And uh, we come to him as the mediator by whom we have access into this grace wherein we stand. For the law made nothing perfect, the weakness of the law and its infirmity is set before us, but uh, the bringing in of a better hope, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast, is uh, a solid hope upon which we may build. Hear us, Lord, as we come, hear the prayers of thy people audibly and privately. We give thanks for the encouraging news regarding the opening of public worship. We pray that nothing might happen in the intervening weeks, or indeed, once we are opened, that would cause things to return again. We pray, Lord, for thy wisdom and leading as we make our way through the maze of regulation and difficulty that will still await us, not least in regard to the dispensing of the Lord's Supper. And Father, um, we do see it as a, a grave thing that we are not able to remember the Lord's death in his appointed manner, uh, month after month within our bounds. And we pray, Lord, for an opening in wisdom in regard to that and uh, thine own help. We commit to thee all who have special needs. Remember them, whether in body or in soul, in uh, the physical frame or in the mind, in uh, uh, concerns for uh, themselves or others. We leave them in thy care. And we pray for those who mourn. We Commit them in their sorrow to thyself. Bless the gospel to the ends of the earth. And as we heard already in prayer, silence other voices that are not for good but for ill. And cleanse us for Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat> well, friends, we turn again to that passage that we read the epistle to the Hebrews, and we believe it is the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews, chapter 7, and we're going to read just now at verse 11. I'm going to take a broad sweep through this part of the chapter, but we'll read at verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise? after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. Mm. Well, on the last occasion, we spent some time looking, you may remember, at Melchizedek. And we spent the greater part of our time looking at two things. First of all, we looked at the background to the chapter and then the details of the chapter. As far as the background was concerned, we looked at the background of the letter itself. 
and its concern to impress upon these Jewish Christians that in embracing Christ, they had not left something superior for something inferior, but that in fact, all they had in Judaism was infinitely inferior to what they have in Christ, who is the fulfillment of the law. So that's the immediate background to all that he's saying. But then we noticed beyond that, not just the immediate background of the chapter, but the wider background of scripture, the meeting between Abraham and Melchizedek in Genesis, and then the appearance of Melchizedek, particularly in Psalm 110. Thou art a priest forever, it says, after the order of Melchizedek. Well, that's a background uh, to the chapter. We then looked at the details of the chapter, and I focused on three things. We focused on Melchizedek, first of all, the functions that he fulfilled as king and prophet. Secondly, uh, as, as, as king and priest, I beg your pardon. Secondly, uh, the generation that he claimed, uh, the unique and unusual reference to him, um, the father without mother and so on, and we dealt with that, I'm not going over it again. The functions he fulfilled, the generation he claimed, and the tithes he received. And all of these things we saw directed us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, all we did that night was scratch the surface. And I indicated then that we would come back to this passage, and that's what we're going to do this evening, because there is a great deal more in the later half of the chapter. Now, perhaps some of these things that I'm going to mention I've already touched on, but I make no apology for coming back to them and underlining them again. I would like to focus our minds on the section from verse 11 onwards to the end of the chapter. And I want to raise from the passage a number of particular issues. Now, what the apostle is doing here, if we're to understand this passage, and surely that's our aim in the exposition of God's word, what the apostle is doing here is marshalling together different strands of evidence to prove the point that he has been making. The point that he's been making since chapter one of this epistle, the superiority of Christ. He begins in chapter one, the superiority of Christ over angels. Then he moves on to the superiority of Christ over Moses and now over the Aaron and the Old Testament priesthood. Christ has a superiority because he belongs to a different priesthood, not of the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. So he's marshalling together evidence to prove that point and to bolster what he's saying in their minds and in ours. Now I want to touch tonight on five of these points which the apostle raises in this section. I'll deal very quickly with the first two, and I shall spend the greater part of our time on the next three thereafter. Well, without further ado then, can we come to the first of the five points I want to set before you? First of all, Christ is superior because, and all of my five points will begin with these words, Christ is superior because of his heavenly nature. He is superior because of his heavenly nature. None of the Old Testament priests, not even Aaron, who stands at the very head of that priestly line, could remotely, remotely resemble the glory and the excellence of Christ. Even when Aaron is consecrated to his office, even when he's clothed in the splendid garments of the high priest, even when he's exercising the functions of that ministry, even when on the great day of atonement, he goes in alone into the most holy place and performs there that annual function. Even then, at the high point, at the very pinnacle of his work and duty, even then, his glory and his excellence is as nothing in comparison to the one 
whom he was setting forth in type and symbol. Verse 15 and 16, it is yet far more evident that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another prophet who is made, another priest rather, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. He is a priest, not after the law of a carnal commandment, but by the power of an endless life. The Old Testament ceremonial law is described here as a, a carnal commandment in the sense that it belonged to this world. It belonged to time, to the here and now, and to the world and to the work of men in this world. It was a carnal commandment. It doesn't belong to the heavenlies. It will have no place and no function in the heavenlies. It is of this world. And those who were occupied in it and affected by it were of this world. That's what they belonged to. Even those of them who were set apart for special function and high office in the Old Testament church, they were part of what was essentially carnal. Oh, yes, we know there were spiritual symbols and, and truth and principle and doctrine behind it. Of course there was. Yes, we know that it was patterned after the heavenly. But it belonged to the here and the now, and it was but for a time. And those who were appointed to work in, in that Old Testament priestly system, they were appointed by the law, verse 16, of a carnal commandment. The law given to Moses and a applied generation after generation. It belonged to this world, whereas Christ is otherworldly. And that alone, supposing the apostle said nothing else in the whole of the chapter, supposing verse 16 was the full stop and the end of his discussion, that alone is enough to nail firmly the point that the apostle is making. Christ is superior because of his heavenly nature. Christ is otherworldly, as it says here. He is the one who has the power of an endless life and who by the power of that endless life exercises the functions of the high priestly office. Aaron didn't do that. It wasn't by that power that he, he, uh, he, he functioned. No, but merely in the outworking of a carnal commandment that belonged to this world. The eternal son of God. Well, that is something entirely and totally different. So that's the first thing then. Christ is superior because of his heavenly nature. Secondly, Christ is superior because of the true access that he gives his people. Christ is superior because of the true access that he gives his people. Let's take an illustration. You might want access to someone or some person, but they or the place are important. It's not easy to gain access. You can't just march in, as it were. You can't just go to the door the way I would go to your door and you to mine and in you come, there's, there's no problem. It's a place or a person to whom access is, is controlled and in many cases prevented. But perhaps you have an advantage. You know the doorkeeper who controls the access. You're able to go and talk to this doorkeeper who is your friend and through the doorkeeper you get into the place or to the person. Maybe you know the manager who oversees the entire estate. Maybe you know the owner himself. The person for whom access to others is strictly limited, maybe because of friendship and bond, you are able to have access. Well, the ceremonial law of the Old Testament church, the entire priestly order was precious because God had given it and because it pointed to Christ. But in and of itself, supposing you followed it to the very letter of the law, 
It couldn't give you access to God. Couldn't give you access to heaven itself. You needed more than that. In that sense, it opened no doors whatsoever. It didn't have the power to open doors. Verse 19. For the law made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope did. By the which we draw nigh to God. You see, Christ gives access. In a way that the ceremonial law could never give us access. All the blood shed brought no access and brought no pardon. None of them or all of it together. And in that sense, you would say there was no hope. But verse 19 that we just read spoke of a better hope. A better hope. Christ brings in a better hope, a real hope, hope of peace with God. I don't mean hope in the big, I hope it won't rain tomorrow sort of way. I mean hope in the biblical, solid, um, substantial sense of hope. Peace with God, hope of heaven, hope of access to God and a way in. By the which we draw nigh to God. What was it we read in chapter 16? Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that which is within the veil. And because he is entered within the veil, his people also are able to enter with him within the veil. So that what was formerly closed and mysterious and hidden and, and away, now we draw nigh. Now we may enter in curtain in the temple it had its own symbolic meaning didn't it and yet on that day that the savior hangs on calvary's tree it is torn open show us the way says thomas i am the way thomas no man cometh to the father but by me but those who come by me come to the father they can have access nobody had access under the ceremonial law, even physically, but the high priest, and even his access, how limited it was, how strictly defined, how closed in with, with caveats. And the rest of the people, they stood far off, watching and trembling. Now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometime were afar off, that doesn't just apply to the Gentile world, but it does certainly to them too, and made nigh are brought in. To go back to my illustration, there's someone you want access to, there's somewhere, but access is limited. But as I said, you know the doorkeeper. Ah, you know the doorkeeper, Christian friend. You know the manager who oversees the whole estate. You know the owner. You are their friend to go back to where we were on Sabbath evening. In Proverbs, the friend, the true friend, this is my friend, and this is my beloved, and through him I have access. I have access through my friend. I can get in where others can't get in because he is the way in. Of course he is. But you know, some people might try to get access somewhere to restricted premises or to a restricted person, and they try to sneak in the back door. But nobody's looking. They, 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 they sneak, sneak in a window or something. Well, that's not how you are, Christian. You're not coming in nervously by, by a back window. You're walking in the front door. And angels marvel at the access that you have. And they say, how does that sinner there in sky or wherever, how does he have access into the presence of God? How does he have access into the holy place? Who does he know? And they know who you know. He knows the Lord of the place. He knows the one who has the key. The doorkeeper. And the Lord of the estate. 
Now, again, supposing this was all that the apostle said, can you not see the excellence and the superiority of Christ? Can you not see what you have in Christ that it would simply not be there otherwise? Would not be there otherwise. The superiority of Christ then. Christ is superior because of his heavenly nature. Christ is superior because of the access that he gives his people. I am the door by me. If any man will enter in, he shall go in and out and find pasture. Thirdly, Christ is superior because of the oath that instituted his priesthood. Because of the oath that instituted his priesthood. Verse 21. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said to him, the Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It goes without saying that anything that involves an oath is more solemn and significant than things that don't involve an oath. Now, while the Old Testament priesthood was both solemn and significant, nowhere is there a hint of it being established or confirmed by an oath. Indeed, verse 21 says exactly that for us. For those priests were made without an oath. They were set apart, certainly, but there was no oath confirming or uh, establishing uh, the, their office. And the Jewish readers who were reading epistle would have to acknowledge, yes, that's true. You will search in vain in the, in the law of Moses for such an oath. But in Christ's case, says Paul, there was an oath. There was an oath. How do we know? Because we know Psalm 110. There in Psalm 110, the psalmist led by the Holy Spirit resurrects this character from the days of Abraham and brings him into the foreground and says, oh, so mysterious, of the order of Melchizedek, thou art a priest forever, referring to Christ. The Lord did say unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes a stool whereon thy feet may stand. And there the eternal son in all his excellence, in all his glory is set before us. And we are told that he will be a priest, not after the order of Levi, but after the order of Melchizedek. And that that will be confirmed and established and grounded by an oath. An oath, mark you, not on the part of man, but on the part of God. Now, God doesn't need to put an oath to anything. His word is his word, and that's the end of it. But in order to assure and reassure and comfort and strengthen his people, he comes down to our level. He uses language and practices which belong to the world of the children of men. And one of them is this reference to an oath. He condescends to put an oath upon himself. What authority then, what superlative dignity, what success undergirds and runs alongside the priesthood of Christ. And what security Christian is yours? If he is your high priest, your high priest is established by an oath. Aaron never was. Eliezer, his son, never was. Will Christ's priesthood ever cease? Will it be dispensed with? Will some cosmic event occur that will cause it to be laid aside? What a catastrophe for you. But it won't be. And how do you know? Because it's confirmed by an oath. God has sworn. And God, as it tells us in this verse, cannot lie. 
God who cannot lie has said and has promised. He is a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek. So Christ's priesthood and your security through his priesthood is not insecure in any way whatsoever. It is established and it can never be disestablished. It is done and it can never be undone. How does he put it in the metrical verse? And the Lord himself hath made an oath and will repent him never of the order of Melchizedek. Thou art a priest forever. God has sworn that those who are in Christ are saved. Though they sin and stumble, you may say, well, I'm a sinner, I sin and stumble. Yes, of course you do. I don't mean that glibly, but it's simply a fact. But how safe they are, even though they stumble, even though they fall. Their high priest never falls. Even though they are where they shouldn't be, he is never where he shouldn't be. And he is never absent from where he should be. And that is confirmed. Verse 21, the Lord swear and will not repent. He will neither repent nor repeal Christ's appointment as priest. And that leads me to my fourth point. We've seen that Christ is superior because of his heavenly nature, because of the access that he gives his people, because of the oath that instituted his priesthood. And fourthly, fourthly, Christ is superior, his priesthood is superior because of its enduring nature. Now, you know the arguments I'm going to make here or the apostle is going to make here. We've, we've gone through this sort of part of the issue often before, so I'll be very quick. Verses 22 and 23. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, has an unchangeable priesthood. 23, 24. They truly, verse 23, were many priests. Yes, at any one time, there were lots of them. You had the immediate priestly order. You had the Levites who helped them. You had the entire tribe, or at least those of, of age, uh, uh, to, to, to be involved in it. At any one time, there were lots. Because none of them were able to perform all the duties. You simply couldn't do it by yourself. There was too much to do. Now, in a sense, the high priest was different. He alone performed his duties. He had no assistance in the more intimate parts of his duties. But again, many of them, there were many of them because they all died. Verse 23. They were not suffered to continue by reason of death. None of the high priests were any closer to completing the work when they died. None of them could say, well, we're nearly finished the work of the priesthood now. Every single one of them, they began at square one, as it were. And, and they didn't really get much beyond square one. They performed all their functions. But there was no end to it. It went on and on, and age and death would remove them all, and others would take their place. Death prevented them from continuing in their work as priests. Now, Christ also died. But unlike all the rest, his death did not prevent him from continuing as priest, because his death was a priestly act. You see, his death was a priestly act. Aaron stopped priestly acts when he died. Like that. Christ, when he dies, is continuing to function as priest. Indeed, he has never been so active in his priesthood as he is in, in death. What a mystery all of this is. In death, he is both the priest offering the sacrifice and the victim who was himself offered. 
God ordained the Old Testament priesthood, but it was never meant to be permanent. It was provisional. It was preparatory. Verse 24, but this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Christ alone does all that is required. He completed the work of sacrifice without any assistance from a creature. And as intercessor, he continues to be lead on behalf of his people. Verse 25, he ever liveth to make intercession for them. There's no need for a successor. No question of who will replace him and take his place. He ever lives. What security again that gives you? You see, you might be an Old Testament Jew, and you might have lived in the time of Aaron, and you might have been a friend of Aaron's. You might have known him from way back in Egypt. You were together when you were leaving Egypt, and you were together when you crossed the Red Sea and in the initial time in the desert. And that would give you a certain confidence. You knew Aaron well. You'd, you'd grown up with him, maybe as, a, as boys together in Egypt. But then... Aaron, Aaron dies. You don't know Eliezer as well as son. You don't have the same confidence in Eliezer. You can't go up to Eliezer as you'd go up to his father. And so your, your, your confidence, your, your bond, if I can put it like that, to the high priest has changed, you see. But not so with Christ. There will never be another Christ, another high priest. Your bond to the high priest will always continue because he will always be high priest. Christ's priesthood then is superior because of its enduring nature. And finally and fifthly, Christ's priesthood is superior because of the absolute purity of Christ's person. And again, I'll deal with this very quickly. Verse 27 reminds us that, well, it reminds us of what we already knew about the Old Testament priesthood. They were all sinners. They all needed sacrifices for their sins, even the best of them. Not so Christ. He is described for us in verse 26. And I've spoken about these words before. I don't need to dwell on them. He is holy. That's primarily in regard to God. He is truly dedicated to God. He is harmless. The focus there is more on his relationship to man and the perception of him. He he is harmless as far as men are concerned. But he isn't just harm. You might have somebody who is harmless, but inside their heart they're a cauldron of crooked sin. But he is also undefiled. He has no corruption. And then it says he is separate from sinners. Separate in the sense that he is separate from our condition. The guilt of Adam's first sin, the want of original righteousness, the corruption of the whole nature. He is separate from all of that. He shall not fail because he is holy, because he is God, because he is everlasting, because he is appointed by an oath. He shall not fail. He shall not let you down. There's Aaron at, 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 at Sinai. You know, you might say, well, Aaron, what a great man he was. He stumbles at Sinai. He's involved in the golden calf incident. And there are other times later on, all issue with Miriam and her, her jealousy of, of Moses and so on. Aaron stumbles, you know. He is not pure. As Christ is pure. And you see the arguments that he is marshaling. And as they read this letter, these Jewish Christians, surely they must have rejoiced. And they must have said, well, I'm going to tell my Jewish friends that they were wrong. They were so wrong. They tried to tell me yesterday that I had embraced something inferior and given up all the glories of, of our worship. And I'm going to tell them when I see them tomorrow that the very opposite is true, that Christ is superior. A priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, my time is gone, but can I just make one or two comments and then I'll, I'll leave it. 
The priesthood of the Old Testament was like road signs pointing to your destination. You know the way it is when you're going to somewhere. Yeah, you're going to Inverness, and yeah, you see signs on the road, the arrows, this way, this way, Inverness, and there'll be signposts, and they'll say Inverness, 40 miles, and Inverness, five miles. Well, the Old Testament priesthood was like that. It was arrows pointing, this way to the Messiah, this way to the Savior, this way to the promised hope, this way, just getting closer now, we're, 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 we're nearly there. And in the New Testament, you've reached the destination. Well, you don't go back to the signposts. You don't say when you reach Inverness, I wish I was still out there on, on the road with, with five miles to go. You don't say, I wish I could still see the signposts. What do you want to see the signposts for? You're seeing Inverness. You've got the reality. You're in Inverness. Why am I saying this? Simply this. Don't go back to a form of worship that mimics the Old Testament. There's a form of worship which mimics the Old Testament. It has to have priests. It's no accident that the Protestant Reformation got rid of any notion that the minister was in any way a priestly function. I mean, one priest. The minister is a, a priest in the sense that all God's people are priests. Worshipping and serving God, the spiritual sacrifices. But any notion of, of an individual set apart in Old Testament form is abhorrent. Don't go back to a worship that mimics the Old Testament. With its priests and its altars and its incense and its instruments. It's all part of the temple worship. All part of the signpost. All part of what was preparatory. You've reached Never mind the signposts that you passed on the way. In Christ you have far better. There is no comparison. And he is exactly the sort of priest that poor, weak sinners need. And he ever lives to plead for those and to secure from his father heavenly blessings that he has purchased. We were singing in Psalm 68. Thou hast, O Lord, most glorious ascended up on high and in triumph victorious led captive captivity. Thou hast received gifts for men. Oh, what sort of men? For such as did rebel. Yea, even for them. Even for them. And these gifts flow to the church through the intercession of Christ as their great high priest. In Christ, in the words of verse 19, we draw near to God. What a blessing. And we come, not by way of shadows and symbols, vaguely understood as the Old Testament church did, but personally and directly through Christ. Oh, as it says in verse 25, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come unto God by him. I must include you, must. Uttermost. Uttermost is made up of two Greek words. Pan, which means all. Telos, which means end. All end. To the furthest end. Uttermost actually captures it well. I think it, my mind has just gone just now, and I, I, I didn't check this up, but I'm almost certain the Gaelic in that verse is when he came as Ajimach, to the furthest out step. It's the same idea. There is nothing beyond the uttermost. Nothing beyond his power in the work of salvation. Nothing to add to it. What folly to add to it. What folly to that. You know, there are people, thousands in this world, and they add to it, they, they trust in saints. And so they'll, they'll put up a prayer to the saint. They'll be very excited about their saint. And all the rest of it. Well, you won't find that in the Bible, friends. What do you need a saint? What do you need? 
somebody who lived and died when you have somebody who is alive forevermore. When you have one, as we have said before us in this church, other people, they trust their own merits. And you decide just now during the so-called season of Lent, well, what will I give up in order that God will be pleased with me? Most of them don't make the slightest connection between what they're giving up and God being pleased with them. But the ones who do honestly make that connection, genuinely make that connection, say, well, oh, if I can just make myself suffer a little bit, surely that'll help. Why? When you are able to access through Christ, oh, friend, you are much better. Be thankful to God if he has delivered you from such notions and such hopes and such vague will-o'-the-wisp ideas if he has brought you to the fullness of understanding and to the certainty of your standing before God in Christ. What folly to add to it. But what folly not to trust it. What folly not to trust it. To put your hope on it and the weight of your soul upon it. For it is well able to bear you up. May God bless his word. Eternal Lord, we bow again before thee with thankful hearts for thy kindness and thy grace in Christ Jesus. Strengthen our understanding of these things and cleanse our worship and all we bring for Jesus' sake. Amen. Love of God, the communion and fellowship of God the Holy Spirit rest on and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.